Hello, you Joe. Excellent. Yourself? Not bad. A little busy. <laughs> I can only imagine. I'm enjoying my little break from running and catching my breath now. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored today to introduce you the Libertarian Party nominee for President of the United States, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. I just have to point out what she represents for the Libertarian Party and how excited I am that we have a candidate who represents Libertarian principles unapologetically with a practical, compassionate message, who isn't relying as we have in the past on a government or political resume to get your attention, but the message and the principles themselves. One of the things that to me, for those of you who are skeptical, is a clear line that she has drawn. And I know this from conversations with her and, and sharing a stage with her in the past, but the clear line of a manifestation of the non-aggression principle in federal policy that she has drawn is that she would pardon everybody she can for victimless crimes. If there's no victim, there's no crime. And now I would like to see change a little faster but just consider the implications of that. We've got Joe for a while. We're going to ask some good questions here and get into some of these policy issues uh, and, and what she's actually proposing for the United States. But, you know, this would fundamentally transform not just the political paradigm, but the federal government itself, eventually at least, into a voluntary institution. Without a president, with the backing of the people saying that the federal government should prosecute people for victimless crimes, their power to enforce them eventually fades away too. Dr. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you who don't know anything about your background, could you help us out with just a, a quick bio? You know, what's, what's your stump speech personal introduction? So my background is I've been in the movement for 40 years. My top three issues are, uh, and, and I know you've been listening to this for six months, sometimes uh, three, four times a weekend. Uh, my top issues are bringing the troops home, health care, and uh, the environment. So I'm trying to talk about issues that the American public uh, is interested in that libertarians can offer a good solution for. And I'd like to point out, yes, we have the best solution for everything. However, these are topics that they're interested in. Yeah. Well, well, Dr. Joe, if, if, if I may, I, I want to, to, to a general public audience, I want you to start by telling us about like how, how your personal background and your resume contrasts to, uh, to Cheeto Jesus and the Kid Snipper. Well, of course, I have absolutely no experience in acting a tax, submitting a, or a, a approving a, um, an unbalanced budget, making government bigger, taking away freedoms. None of that experience. Uh, <laughs> my experience is living under the law. And, and I would like to mention on a serious note that, yeah, when, when our founders created the Constitution, they had the idea of a citizen statesman. So not only were they supposed to only make a few laws, but they were supposed to go home and live underneath those laws. And, <laughs> and, you know, we've got Joe Biden, who's, you know, never lived under a law that he created. And I wish I could remember the name of the politician who said, who, who said this. You know, this is before we had 24-hour news shows. Uh, this was back, you know, I don't know, maybe 1980s. And uh, a Democrat. As you know, we had the 1964 civil rights where you can't, uh, you can't uh, discriminate gender, race, creed, and so forth. Well, what people didn't realize is that Congress was not subject to those same laws. And so somebody comes along and says, you know, maybe you ought to follow this 1960, you know, this, this little old 1964. <laughs> Thing that you thought was so important and this guy I'll never forget um, a, he was an older gentleman you know white hair and he puffed up his chest and he said I should be able to hire whoever I want <laughs> okay uh. there, there we go we've got the elite you know, animal farm all over again we've got the elite few at the top 
who are making laws for everybody else, but oh no, they don't have to follow their own laws. And and what was sad was in the nineties, um, and, and you know, since I'm talking to such a young whippersnapper, uh, let me explain <laughs> you about my generation of politics. So in the nineties, everybody was all up in arms because Congress had their own barber shop. You know, taxpayers were going to pay for the barber shop, which correct taxpayers shouldn't be paying for the barber shop. They get paid enough; they can afford their own haircuts, but. <clears throat> It, it was that they were focused on barber shops and not, you know, uh, racism and sexism and and fairness and hiring when they themselves passed that law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the animal farm reference. That's funny, just weird coincidence. I made one like twenty minutes ago before you came oh. on. <laughs> uh, you know, all, all like we're talking about healthcare. You know, is the governor proposing universal health care for black Americans going to give up his special health care elite plan? Uh, all, all Americans are equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, the, the same with um, what was I going to mention uh, with Social Security that the people in Congress have their own nice little you know, retirement system. So, and, and they've got the money, they can afford it. But yeah, I wish Animal Farm were required reading for yeah. every, <laughs> every grade school kid. That, <laughs> I think that opened up my eyes more than anything else. You know, I have, I have to point out, I, I don't mean to laugh at all of these things yeah. that Joe has just pointed out, because some of them, like the thing, especially about the, the federal law has led to a lot of uh, serious actual sexual abuse. Right. Um, of, of congressional staffers and it's just the the irony of it, it w when you're able to step back and see how silly it's hard not to laugh at at the irony of, of all these you know relatively I, mean, I hate to say small because they're still injustices but compared to the bigger tragedies right. of government like the Federal Reserve and war and things like that but Joe before we get to policy one other quick question you're, you know we didn't get to talk about this as much as I had hoped you know, my undergraduate degree is in psychology. Oh, cool. And, and, and I really value that background, both for self-awareness and in activism, in understanding others and in understanding politics and motivations and emotions. And even through the, the sort of bridge of, you know, Ludwig von Mises' concept of uh, praxeology and, and understanding incentive-based economic analysis, do you think your background in psychology is, um, or I should say, how, how do you think it's, it's helping you at this point? Well, anything other than a law degree, I think, would be <laughs> a, a, you know, a positive. So, uh, and, and I'll, I'll quote Dr. Phil. Well, I don't want to do that. Um, I, 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 I don't want to. You, there are many fine lawyers in this country. The point I'm trying to make is <laughs> when you go to Washington, you need to put laws in effect that average people can understand <laughs> yeah yeah so, and that's the problem but yeah with psychology uh i i i got a little what they call into the weeds on another show explaining how why ron paul has such staying power with the elaboration likelihood model and i was reminded that i'm a presidential <laughs> candidate not um a psychology <laughs> professor um, but if you're interested in knowing that we're all libertarians, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you honestly, you know, I, there's there's an important, you know, mental health awareness and just understanding how, you know, human psychology works that they don't teach you in high school and government run schools. And, and, I, and I hope that, you know, the awareness like and, and to me, I'll, I'll just say one thing about my experience that, that was extremely formative and you from studying developmental psychology and working with at-risk youth in, in Claremont, California, it was the, and, and also in going to Iraq and, and seeing people as the product of conditioning that when you understand, you know, in a sense, it, it, you know, as we say as libertarians, everybody is responsible for their actions and their behavior. They are also the product of so much trauma and violence and abuse and and there's there's a, a sort of clinical way that removes the fault and the blame and creates space for a lot more compassionate ways of addressing problems that have uh, an emotional or, or a mental health component. 
So that being said, um, how how are you enjoying the trail? I mean, I know from we we had an online convention, which was uh, you know unprecedented for us, of course, for the LP, and generally you know a, a, a you know a solid process. But now, I mean, and I saw you got to go to a candlelight vigil at one of the the George Floyd protests. So if you could tell us about that a little bit, please. But the trail in general is it more virtual than than you would have anticipated? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I I knew I knew that I would be you know stuck in my home like Joe Biden, but at least I'm not in the basement. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, at least you know you know here's the good news is it's hard for us to compete with Democrats and Republicans because as you often say, there's a duopoly, and uh, because of course they've got the money, so they've rigged the system against us. So we're having to spend our money on ballot access instead of actually on campaigning. But at least, hey, I, I, I can get a better background than Joe Biden. So, uh, it, you know, at least now we're on a level playing field, both locked up. But yeah, New Hampshire is the only place I've traveled to. Uh, I, I think I'm going someplace once towards the end of June and then, uh, of course, the convention. And so it was great to actually meet new people. And I love New Hampshire because when I uh, was the VP nominee in 96, I think I spent four days. I spent longer in uh, New Hampshire than any other uh, state in, you know, I went to 32 different states and I spent longer in New Hampshire than anywhere. So it's an awesome state, as I will, you know, uh, as you well know, because I know you went everywhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, by the way, I, I hope you're, you are coming to the national convention, right? Oh, yes. I mean, I, well, it's, awesome. I mean, I'm still like, oh, crap, anything could happen at this point. I mean, it is scary. I, I, I mean, it's a great transition to get into that. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, even planning a trip from, to drive from Arizona to Florida, you know, like that, we, we saw just uh, about a month ago, I think it was now, you know, the coronavirus does have a tendency to cause blurred vision in news analysis. Um, there's, uh, you know, it seemed like every day felt like a week for a while. We saw vehicle checkpoints, you know, going into Florida specifically, right, stopping right. people from New York coming into Florida. Who knows what's going to be, I'm all for it, you know, and I understand that there are going to be some people who might not be able to for legal, logistical type reasons. Um, but it, it, unless, unless there are men with guns or women, yeah. if they send female officers with guns, I'll, I'll be disrespectful, I promise. But if they said, unless, unless they put people with guns, you know, if they put enforcement agents in between me and Orlando, I'll, I'll be, if it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. And, and I hope you're encouraging all of your listeners to attend because absolutely. You know, I, I'm absolutely. sure there won't be as many people as there usually are. So I'd love to see as many people as we can. Yeah, I know. And it's going to be a really important time for the team of the party to come together and, yeah. and organize around your campaign and, and to level up. So I hope you're ready to recruit a lot of volunteers. All right. So first, oh, okay. and, and can I mention, guys, sorry to interrupt, but you, you talked about recruiting a lot of volunteers. We cannot believe how many people have volunteered and many of them are non-libertarians, many more than we expected. So it, we are so happy about that. Excellent. Yeah, it's a good, I mean, you remember it in 2016, we were all saying, it's the wor the wor best opportunity, the two most hated candidates in duopoly history with Trump and Clinton. Well, it keeps getting better, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and here's what I'm hoping to capitalize on, because I know a lot of people were saying that, and, you know, they hate both candidates. But I could also see that, and, and I was one of the few that had predicted Trump, although unfortunately I didn't have a podcast, so I can't go back and say I told you so. <laughs> you know, just like the three people around me that I, that, you know, I wanted to make bets with. But the one thing that I kept hearing about and seeing was basically people who had never voted or hadn't voted in 20 years, they wanted something different. And so I think it would have been hard for Gary Johnson to get those votes because because they saw a mainstream person as being an outsider, you know, somebody parachuting in at the top. And I agree. Uh, Trump, uh, you know, didn't have 40 years of political favors to uh, repay. So he was an outsider. But then he gets into office and he acts like everybody else. So now I'm hoping that those people who thought that Trump would be so great, uh, now that they realize that he didn't give them what they want, 
I hope that now that they've got their voter registration card, you know, that they didn't have before 2016, I hope now they will use that card to uh, vote for me to get what they wanted the first time around, which is an outsider and somebody different. Yes. Okay. So, Joe, the first question that's sort of bigger policy type stuff is, is a, the really big, hard one. And you got to give me just a second to kind of explain this. Of and the course. question is basically, where are things going right now? Where's America going right now? Where's the world going right now? Specifically, with all of the recent major shift in world society dynamics around the coronavirus, around the government response, obviously more importantly, more significantly, around George Floyd. I've set this up. One of the narratives that I've suggested is that maybe the Democrats set a trap for Trump with the coronaphobia crisis to, and basically tricked him into, instead of you know, having a moderate, appropriate response, you know, going heavy handed and then bragging about it in a press conference. And he thought, okay, I got one foot in the trap. I got one foot out. I can pull it out. And then the other foot slips on a banana peel named George Floyd. And, you know, maybe we're not going to have an election in November. Maybe it's like even DC just went to email ballots. You know, is like, and I'm I'm all for the technology there, just for the record. That, but do I trust the government to do it with transparency and an accountability that would it, it be satisfactory to anybody who cares? Of course not. So, Joe, in those sort of bigger dynamics uh, with the United States, with the world, over the next six months, over the next two or three years, I, I really, I, I suppose, I would only ask you to speculate until your inauguration in January of next year, but. Where are things going? Well, first, I have more optimism than you have in the actual voting. I do think that we will be able to vote in person. I, 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 I really do think so. And I did hear, um, yeah, th there was somebody who had said, you know, we voted during wars, we voted during the Depression, we you know, all these things that we voted during. And then, of course, the person wanted an online election or, or to can't, you know, to postpone the election, but. Um, yeah, it, of course, the country's going in the wrong direction. And with everything that's been going on, uh, my concern is that people are believing the narrative because if they didn't believe the narrative, we'd be much better off. And as you know, healthcare is one of my major issues. And it's just frustrating that people have bought into the narrative that we don't have a free market or, or no, that we do have a free market health system right. and that that free market health system does not work. And so now we need to try something different. So th that's, that's what I've been saying is if, if I can get one idea across, because a lot of people, you know, most people aren't interested in politics like you and I are, you know, most people don't treat it as like our sport our you know, our, our, yeah, right. our, our, yeah the, the Sunday afternoon sport, we're going to watch politics. Most people... Wait, you can constrain yourself to Sundays? <laughs> well, no. Yeah, it was an analogy, metaphor. I always get those two confused. But I, I was a science major. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is um, that uh, people aren't interested enough in politics to dig to the next level or the level after that. But yep. I am hoping that maybe the turmoil will open up some of their eyes. I'm, I'm hoping that, that that will cause some changes. And, and my big hope, again, is that the people who voted for Trump, and I don't blame them at all, by the way. If, if I didn't know a lot about politics, I would have voted for him too, because here's somebody who's not a politician who says, hey, I'm going to come in and change things. And that's basically my message. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm not a politician. I'm going to change things. So I, I, I can understand the overwhelming support of getting Trump into office. I just hope that those same people see that things have not gotten better. I hope they're keeping up with the deficit and that they realize that the deficit has gotten bigger and it hasn't gotten smaller, as he said it would. George Floyd and defunding the police, Black Lives Matter, your take on all of that? Well, I pointed out that the federal government is the one who militarized the police. 
maybe if the police didn't own tanks and uh, other paramilitary equipment, that wouldn't have happened. And um, yeah, we, we could go back to that and talk about what, what caused, you know, what caused all that because, okay, talk about psychology. Does my psychology help? Yeah, there's something called the weapons effect. And yeah, if you've got weapons lying around, you're, you're more likely to use them. So what if you were to put it on a referendum and ask the average person, hey, uh, would you like your taxes raised to maybe get a new swimming pool for the high school or remodel the grade school? Somebody might say, sure. If you ask them, okay, do you want your property taxes to go up to buy a tank? <laughs> you know, probably most people would say uh, no. So what do they do? The federal government takes our money without our choice, buys the tanks, and then goes back to the police department and says, hey, you know, want a free tank? It's free. Oh, and by the way, we give you free training, and we've got, you know, some other money in our back pocket here that we will pay you for um, additional equipment as you see fit. Who's going to say no? You know, people don't say no to free stuff. And 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 I don't blame them because, I mean, of course, I don't like it. I wish they wouldn't do it. But I don't blame them because they're looking at it as saying, well, that's our money. Uh, of course, we would rather have the benefit of our money instead of, you know, Alabama or New York or Texas, whatever state isn't yours. So um, <clears throat> they take the stuff and then they become militarized. And now weapons effect, they've got the stuff and now they're going to use it. So uh not a good idea and uh as far as the police defunding this is where i get to use the great libertarian you know make the great libertarian point of we have too much intermingling between state and federal parties uh and as president if somebody wants to defund their police department you know oh well that i should only be i should only be called in if I need it and if I'm asked for help by the governor. I don't just go around putting my uh, nose where it doesn't belong. And here's where I completely agree with you on localization. Absolutely, police is a, is a local issue. Um, who you hire, who you fire, do you have body cams, do you not have body cams? All of those choices should be made by the people who live with those choices, namely the residents, the property owners who are paying the taxes, the citizens who live there, and the police. Let them let them worry, worry about it. Federal government should not be involved. Absolutely. Victims of family law for Jorgensen. I'm happy to see Chris Cole transfer that support from what we had in our campaign for you in the general, because I think this is a really under discussed issue yeah. and i don't know if it needs to be front and center but it definitely needs to be discussed more what can you do as president what are you proposing to the american people that we can do from the federal level to help reform family courts to deal with families being ripped apart by government government sponsored child kidnapping the foster system and all the federal and, and legal incentives for these legal evils that are destroying American families. Again, localization is key. This is something the federal government should not be in. Uh, the needs of rural Appalachia are much different than downtown Manhattan, so let's let the people handle it. And when you put people closer to the problem, they're going to be more, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> more invested, more understanding. They're going to see the people who are in need. They're going to see the people who, um, you know, how they can be helped to the, the best instead of taking the money, sending it to Washington, and then hope you get some back after some money is taken out. And you've probably heard my, my explanation for charity, uh, one of them anyway, <clears throat> which is that if you had money, let's say you got a uh, an inheritance and, you, and you're trying to decide where to spend it and you want to really help those in need and so you know let's say help help those in need on this issue so um are, are you going to maybe donate money to the church because maybe the church can help victims you know a lot of people run to their churches for help are you going to give it to some private charity who uh who has some kind of um you know organization or are you going to say, no, I'm going to give my $10,000 inheritance to a federal government program? 
I mean, people laugh when they hear that. They know that giving their money to the federal government is not going to help them as much as if they kept it in their own community and could help the people more directly. And in fact, what used to happen is the charity, more dollars went to charity when it was handled locally. Charity like police, again, a local, local issue. Veterans issues, you know, something really near and dear to me and, 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 you know, a tricky one for libertarians when you look at the situation with the VA today. What's your policy priority for vets? Yeah, and let me mention, and, and if I haven't thanked you for your service, I, I believe I have. Let me thank you now. Well, no, I, no, I think you know better than that, Joe, because you, no. know, you know my take on that. When someone says that, you mean serving bankers and politicians and war profiteers? I demand that you separate these ideas, right. that, that you can thank me for my intent, but not for my service. It was your time. It was your time on this earth that you willingly gave. So I think that demands a lot. And by the way, my dad was a veteran as well. Um, you know, we had the uh, veteran, when, when he died several years ago, we had you know, the flag and the whole ceremony. So um, I have utmost respect for veterans because you're right, the intention is to help our country, to serve and protect, to protect our citizens. Um, but as with everything else, the government can't do anything very well. And the, the VA hospital is just atrocious. And I don't know why that alone doesn't scare the average American from uh, a single payer system or you know Medicare for all. And you and I were both calling it, yeah, the VA hospital for all. Why would you want that? And I think the one of the best things we can do to help the veterans, and I hope you agree with me, is to shut down the whole VA hospital system and put the dollars in their own um, under their own care or, or their own uh, control and let them go out and find the health care that yeah. they need and let the doctors yeah. compete so that when doctors compete, they give them the best care. And as you know, if we look at cosmetic surgery and LASIK surgery, those are the only two kind of non, you know, those are the only two somewhat free market uh, yeah. specialties because people spend their own money, not the insurance company. And so those doctors have to compete for our business. And so, and, and, and I'm explaining this because I don't want anybody to think, oh, gee, she wants to just, you know, put veterans out on their own. No, people, when they want LASIK surgery, they look at different doctors, they compare prices and they get to yep. keep what they don't yep. spend. And so the doctors have to compete for their business. Car dealers have to compete for your business. Computer manufacturers have to uh, compete for your business. Why not doctors? And I want to see doctors competing against each other to provide our veterans with the best care possible. Yeah, so switching more to an outsourcing role. I mean, the bureaucracy can't screw up as much when it's just moving the money around instead of also spending all of it and removing any competitive element. I suppose it goes without saying that you would also end any drug war type restrictions that would prevent uh, the exploration and, and appropriate well, study of PTSD treatments like MDMA and psilocybin uh, that are now scheduled whatever illegal. Yeah, psilocybin has shown, shown such promise with uh, depression. Uh, but, you know, people just have, you know, a, a stereotype a prejudice against it, and it's a shame. And we would not have had the opioid crisis we have if marijuana had been legal. It's just, and, and it's not just a matter of, it's my body, I should be able to do it what, with it what I want. It's a medical issue. It's the government saying you cannot have the medicine that you require. And I had met an author, um, a well-known author back in the 90s who had AIDS. And this was back before, you know, when, when AIDS was basically a death sentence. And when he tried to take the medication, he would get terribly sick and he couldn't keep his food down. And so he used marijuana and he got caught, thrown in jail and you know, basically starved to death because he couldn't get, uh, he couldn't keep the food down and they didn't have the drugs they have today or the synthetic marijuana that, you know, for, for some reason, the earlier version of synthetic marijuana didn't work. And it's like, 
So you're going to deny somebody taking this plant <laughs> um, and basically die. Yeah. Now, I, I know this is this sounds like I'm getting all kind of grammar Nazi on you, but oh. it is it is a it is a meaningful thing in the wording that I've, I, I didn't I, I don't take it too seriously, but that I've slowly conditioned myself and hearing the community use the term more. It's the cannabis community, not the marijuana community. Oh, okay. You know, and I, I think just I, I mean, I'm I'm grateful that we I mean, Gary Johnson was pretty good on you know talking about pot too but yeah i i just it's it just occurred to me like yeah i i, I it's the cannabis community now and i, and well, I just I, I i hope you can because we're so we're both like we're both the products of so much propaganda and conditioning even around this until you point out to people look no marijuana is the evil propaganda racist term meant to scare you about this evil demon weed from mexico and now i mean it's benign now you know, we don't, we don't, it, but it, it, you know, it, you go, wow, how did, how did that become the term that we use to describe this miracle plant? Well, I'll have to have, I'll have to have a, a meeting about that with my team because you're absolutely right. I don't want to use something that has a, a, a negative connotation. Yeah. No, no, no one would hold it against but, you. Like, it's just but, that there's a better. Right. But on the other hand, how familiar are they with cannabis and not marijuana? So I want to speak in the American voters. Oh, I that's want an interesting question. Oh, yeah, that you, you're, you're going to lose. I don't know. How many, Jim, how many, do you think any Americans now like still don't know, like, when you say cannabis, the, what, what you're talking about? I think it's out there enough. Yeah. But yeah, do the, do, do the calculation for the flip. That's good messaging awareness. So just yeah. two more quick questions before we go to the peanut gallery here. We have uh, we have Jim, comment Jim Freedom in studio watching our live stream and the comments. So if anybody wants to add a question for Dr. Jorgensen, throw it in right now. Jim will get to it in just a couple minutes. Dr. Joe, Federal Reserve Policy. Uh, first audit, then abolish. And while I was auditing, I would go to Ron Paul and ask for his recommendation of who to put in charge while we were getting ready to dismantle it. All right. Why, why do you have to audit it before abolishing it? Uh, because it would be the equivalent of bursting a bubble, like how we had the real estate bubble. And when it bursts, it kind of falls apart. So, okay. So just, just, so it's not, it's, it's, it's not to determine whether or not no, to abolish no, it. No, it's no, just no. to understand, to take account of it. It's sort of as it's sort of the first. You, you could just say abolishing it then, right? Because we're going to audit. Yeah, we're going to look at what we're abolishing before. We're not just going to like throw a grenade at it, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, so, I'm, I'm often, right. Yeah, I'm often asked the question: audit or abolish? So, or or do I want to audit it? So apparently audit. Right. Apparently, auditing the FDA is a big thing. So I want to make clear to the people who want it audited that yes, I'm hearing you, and I will audit it. And but <laughs> all right, well said. You're planning to get into the debates. We're working, and as I mentioned, we are so excited that just the fact that we've got so many followers, and just the fact that we've got so many non-libertarians. And usually, when you ask people, um, you know, why do you want to work for the campaign? Uh, you know, like, well, I'm a libertarian, you know, a hardcore libertarian, I work on campaigns. And we're just getting people who are saying, we want Joe to be president. We don't want the two old rich white guys. So I think, and, and again, I, and you were in all the debates. I never stood up there and said, I'm a woman, vote for me. Um, but it, apparently it is to my advantage that people are saying, we don't want the two old white guys. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, especially at this point. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I believe we covered everything that we needed to from our patron only Patreon Telegram chat. Do we have any other questions, Jim, that uh, we need to get into the mix here? I saw one from Erica Creech on Facebook and she asks, Joe Jorgensen, would you look at HH Dalai Lama emotional hygiene curriculum? This is for elementary through high school. Thank so you. wait, is, is that's not written in the chat, bo chat box? No, there. Oh, hey, look at that! All right, look at that. Our amazing producer on top of that. Yeah. So emotional hygiene curriculum. Have you heard of that? No. Huh. Right, so well, of, of course, my platform is to get rid of the Department of Education, 
And if people want to use their own money to have that in their school, of course, I wouldn't stop that. As, I mean, unless it's taking away somebody else's rights. Right. So, Joe, let me turn this into, uh, I think, a more positive question for you and, and, and for everybody that will, will satisfy the questioner as well. Is that when we see government out of education entirely, or at least down to the local or community and voluntary level, as a professional educator, what shift in the education paradigm do you think is going to be most helpful? Like, as the questioner suggested here, possibly something with more emotional awareness, you know, maybe teaching civics in high school again, or financial planning, or how the dollar works, and what is it, in, in, or, or unschooling, or, you know, student-based learning. What You know, as a professional educator, what shift do you see in education is most helpful for America? Well, yeah, so there's a little misconception in our country about educator, about the education industry. Uh, even though I teach college, I do not have a degree in education. I've never even taken an education class because at the college level, what they do is they take people in their field and just hope that they can kind of teach well enough. Um, <laughs> I realize is, you know, maybe it wasn't planned to be that way because the whole college experience started off as you've got the learned scientist or whoever who takes a few people under his wing. Yes, I said his on purpose because, of course, women weren't allowed to be, um, you know, scientists back then or, or professors. And then, um, or at least, I'm not saying there was a law against it, but that wasn't done. And... Uh, and then they would teach the few kind of as a mentor. And so I really do not know a lot about uh, education at the elementary level, except to know that once again, localization is key. And once again, I'm going to trust the teachers and parents to come up with a, the best system for the students uh, because I, I know nothing about the uh, curriculum except to know that as you know, as president, I would give them educational freedom for the first time in their lives. <laughs> awesome. CJ, if you would, please pull up Dr. Joe's website here. Our, our producer um, has this all ready to go here. And I want to point this out so that people know where they can go to volunteer, to sign up, to get on your email list, to donate. Uh, is there anything you want to point out about the, the website or about your campaign or, or any uh, final thoughts about how people can connect with you this year, Joe? No, as I mentioned, I'm. we are just ecstatic to get so many people who are non-libertarians. So we would love your help. And uh, again, I'm, I'm with you, Adam, on all of the uh, libertarian issues as far as we need to get the federal government out of, you know, crime, the police departments, education, charity, all of those things. So uh, if you agree with Adam, please check us out on our website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Jorgensen. I encourage everybody to do that. And best of luck on the campaign trail. We're looking forward to catching up with you again periodically over the next few months. And uh, in about a month, we're going to be talking to your running mate, uh, Spike Cohen, and getting an update on, on how the trail is treating him. But as always, uh, the Adam versus the Man platform is at your service. Well, thank you so much, and I can't wait to see you in uh, July. <laughs> and your Excellent. lovely new bride as well. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. We'll see you, and, and say, say hi to her for me. <laughs> Will do.